we have just a little bit of time and a really long sermon. So what we're going to do is sort of do this, okay? <laughs> so stay with me. I can talk fast when necessary. You may remember that we looked at this issue last week of a, of a stumbling block and how Paul addresses the issue of things that Christians can do that will cause others to stumble. Jesus had warned about that. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. It is necessary that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the person by whom they come. So we know from the words of Jesus that we don't want to do anything that is going to put an obstacle in front of someone, something for someone to trip over that will keep them from Jesus or keeping them from entering into everlasting life. So we have responsibility as Christians. When the Christian community began to come together in the day of Jesus, and we referenced some of this last week, they came from every background conceivable. The Jewish people of all different backgrounds themselves, different sects of religious beliefs among the Jews. But then, of course, the gospel went to the Gentiles, and now everyone started coming in with all different ideas and all different backgrounds. So we discover that Paul spent a great deal of time trying to help the new believers understand that within the Christian community, we are to treat each other with love and respect, even treating others better than we treat ourselves, and make sure that we don't do anything that might cause them to lose their way in following Jesus. So we see this throughout the writings of Paul, and we observed some of that last week as it relates to this issue of food that was taken and dedicated to the idols. You may remember that we mentioned it's sort of like having the blessing over the food before it's ever sold. And so you have the blessing over the food. Well, in the mind of many, especially those that had come out of paganism, that food was now dedicated to the idol. Therefore, if you ate it, you were worshiping the idol. You may remember Paul said, now nah, look, that's irrelevant. Don't worry about it. It's food God gave it. Eat it. But he did say, be careful because you may offend someone else's faith by doing that. So in every experience of the Christian life, we have to be aware that there are those around us that we need to be uh, cautious and aware of our behavior so that it doesn't uh, d redirect them and they don't uh, follow Jesus and, and they end up not inside of the kingdom of heaven. Well, in that passage that we looked at about meat and offer to idols, there's more. And I felt that it was necessary to address this issue of the law, as Paul was relating to it, among the new Christian believers. Think about this for just a moment. The Jewish people had been raised all their life to think about the law and the observance of the law as the way to eternal life. Now, when we say law, normally we are going to think of the Ten Commandments. But in the Jewish mind of the day of Jesus and the apostles, it was a much broader concept than that. The law was anything that certainly was in the Ten Commandments, but specifically the writings of Moses were called the law. But also it went beyond that to include all the writings of the Old Testament and then even the teachings of the rabbis. So that was kind of the mindset that the Jewish believers had, that in order to gain eternal life, there had to be perfect performance of the law. That's why these religious leaders were always following Jesus, trying to see if maybe there was some way or some point at which he did not follow the law of Moses, and then they could lift him up as one that was a sinner. Well, when Jesus came, we see a transition that took place. No longer within the Christian community was there the emphasis on the law of Moses. Well, that it, at least is on the part of some. So there was tension now because there are those that still wanted to hold on to that law of Moses and others that said, no, now because of Jesus, we have moved beyond that instruction given by Moses 
back there in Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, etc. So we move beyond that. You can see right away that there must have been tremendous tension. Let's go back to Romans 14, which is the passage that we've looked at over the last few weeks. And now we're going to draw in part of it that we haven't seen. One person regards one day holier than other days. This is part of that same passage that we've already looked at, but now here's more of it. <clears throat> Another regards them all alike. Each must be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day does it for the Lord. The one who eats eats for the Lord because he gives thanks to God. The one who abstains from eating abstains for the Lord. He gives thanks to God. And so that eating passage, we have concentrated on that some. But now we see Paul bringing in this other idea of these various religious behaviors that came from the teachings of Moses. And so he addresses that in this passage but it's not perfectly clear exactly what Paul is talking about simply because he sort of mentions that in passing. There are two other comparison passages that Paul wrote that are similar to this one that we just saw, one in Galatians and one in Colossians. This is the one in Galatians, but now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless ba basic forces. Do you want to be enslaved to them over again? You're observing religious days, months, and seasons, and years. And then a similar one in, the, in Colossians. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you with respect to food or drink, or in the matter of a feast, or a new moon, or Sabbath days, these are only the shadow of things to come, but the reality is Christ. So now we have Paul reflecting back on that legal code given by Moses, and he is telling people now that it's not necessary for you to observe those things any longer. In fact, we'll see he actually makes it very emphatic where he says that if you do that, you have actually left Christ. Well, Paul now is addressing these issues back there, these things that Moses wrote back in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And so when we look at this, we say, okay, how do we understand what Paul is writing? The Apostle Paul wrote out, and the people that he wrote to, they sort of knew the background and what he was addressing. We don't always know that, and because the term law is used in various ways, it's kind of hard at times for us to sort out some of these things. We have to look carefully at the context and comparison passages to understand exactly what the Apostle Paul is trying to address. You know, uh, there is a saying that long ago is a different country. It is a country whose customs and ways we don't understand. And there's always a struggle with understanding the Bible as we look back on these things to put ourselves in the mentality of those that were receiving the writing and of what the writer was addressing. But there's no, I think there, there is little uh, uh, room for misunderstanding that the Apostle Paul was now moving the Christian church away from the teachings of Moses and was redirecting them to a different way of life, both the Jewish Christians and the non-Jewish Christians. Now, in all of this, Paul said to be careful as people are working through this not to put a stumbling stone in front of anyone. 
But they had a lot of issues that they had to address and work through. Let's go back now to the book of Romans. We started there in chapter 14. Let's go back to chapter 7, and this will help us as we try to sort through these issues of law and what the Apostle Paul was trying to get the people of his day to understand. But now we have been released from the law. Follow this. Because we have died to what controlled us, so that we may serve now in the new life of the Spirit and not under the old written code. Now we know that that legal code of Moses became a tremendous burden on the people. And so the people had to constantly wonder, have I kept enough of the law in order to gain salvation? And this was the mentality under which they lived. I know some Adventists that have lived under that kind of mentality. But can you imagine, if you haven't, trying to every day of your life wake up and say, have I kept enough of the law that God is now obligated to take me into his kingdom and to give me eternal life? And every day you wake up and you have doubts and despondency because you know in your heart that you're probably not as good as you should be in order for God now to be obligated to take you into eternal life. And so every day you have the struggle. The Apostle Paul is addressing this with the believers. And he says to them, you have been released from the law. What a breath of fresh air that must have been. Paul says, now, I don't want you to wake up every day and I don't want you to say to yourself, have I kept the law good enough? Have I kept it? Have I gotten that level of achievement where God, when I knock on his door, will have to say, come right in. I have no choice except to have you here. Paul says, you have been released from that. He says, I want to tell you, you have been saved. You have eternal life. You have been set free from that old way of thinking about God and how God justifies you and brings you into his kingdom. So it says, but now we've been released from the law because we have died to what controlled us so that we may serve in the new life of the Spirit. All of us know that law-keeping is always done better when our heart is into it. If the speed limit on a nice, well-paved, four-lane road is 25 miles an hour, you know you're not into it. You want to do something entirely different, and you look around and you say there are no houses, it's a four-lane road, who in the world in the right mind would put up a speed limit of 25 miles an hour, and you know your heart is not there, but you do 25 miles an hour because you think maybe the officer is down there hiding in the bushes down the street somewhere. And so you do it even though you don't want to do it. And that is the law keeping of the people of the day of Jesus and of the Old Testament. And Paul now says, you have been set free. Only now you can do what God wants you to do because your heart is right with him and you want to perform what God wants you to do out of love. And it's a whole different motive. Watch this now as Paul continues here in Romans chapter 7. What shall we say then is the law of sin? He says, is the problem with the law? Now, immediately we begin to think, what law is Paul talking about, right? Because we know he's already said those passages that we look at, leave people alone and, you know, don't make them keep the law. And we're going to see in a minute that he even comes and says that if you keep the law, he says, you have left Jesus. 
So watch this now. Is the law sin? Absolutely not. Certainly I would not have known sin except by what means? Through the law. See, Paul cannot on the one hand and say sin, def- the, the sin is defined by the law. And then, then on the other hand, say if you keep the law, you have left Jesus. Watch what he does with all of this. I would not have known sin except through the law, for indeed I would not have known what it means to desire something that is coveting, belonging to someone else, if the law had not said what? Do not covet. So now we see that Paul here is clearly laying out the principles contained in the Ten Commandments. And Paul says those principles are, are the principles that God wants us to live by. When God said, don't covet, if my heart is right with Him, then I will live by the Spirit of what that law means. That's why Jesus would say things like, listen, if you're angry with your brother, It's the same as if you kill your brother, right? Because what? That's the spirit of the law. That's what Jesus was driving at. Let's continue with Paul. Did that which is good, he's talking about the Ten Commandments here, obviously. That which is good then become death to me? Absolutely not. But here's the problem. But sin, that it would be shut. What is sin? What did Paul just say sin was? He said, sin is defined by the Ten Commandments, right? All right? He says, but sin, that is the violation of the Ten Commandments, that desire my heart to rebel against God and those principles that he laid out, so that it would be shown to be sin produced death in me through what is good, that is the commandment, so that through the commandment, sin would become what? utterly sinful. So there's nothing wrong with the commandment. Paul says the commandment right here in the same uh, uh, general area here in Romans 7, but the commandment is holy, just, and good. So there's no problem with the Ten Commandments. Paul lays that out. But he does not relate to everything that Moses wrote in the same way. Because most of what Moses wrote, get this, follow this, most of what Moses wrote, Paul says, now should be laid aside and no longer followed. So he separates out the Ten Commandments from the rest of it. Going now to the book of Galatians, this is a passage that we looked at last week. We'll come back to it again in just a moment. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you at all. You know, one of the significant premier teachings in the writings of Moses, is this whole issue of circumcision. And so now the Jewish believers had grown up thinking that circumcision was certainly necessary in order for God to let you into his kingdom. Now, it's convoluted thinking. I mean, okay, what, what is God inspecting in order to let you into his kingdom And it would seem to me, since this circumcision law only related to men, that the women would be left entirely out. So, well, that's it's convoluted, you know. But this was the Jewish way of thinking. We, We can't go into all of that right now. But that's the way that they were thinking. And so Paul says, listen, I want to tell you that if you follow that, you have left Jesus. But when Peter came, this is uh, Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, 
I opposed him to his face. So we've gone back now in the book of Galatians. This is back in chapter 2. And Paul's going to explain some of these things that we see him addressing there in chapter 5 that we just looked at. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he had clearly done wrong. Until certain people came from James, that was the leader of the church at the time, he had been eating with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he stopped doing this and separated himself, himself because he was afraid of those who were pro-circumcision. So those that wanted to follow the law of Moses, uh, they came and, uh, you know, Peter said, okay, I can no longer eat with the Gentiles because Moses was against that. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been in the early Christian church? When you look back at the Old Testament and you see those passages where it was said by Moses, don't have anything to do with those people if they're not Jewish people. Leave them alone. Exclude them. See, our mentality is entirely different. We think about taking the gospel to all the world. Why? Because we stand in that long tradition of Jesus now sharing the gospel with the world, the good news of salvation with everyone. So those new believers that came in, they were coming into a, a tradition that was different than that from which they had been excluded. And now they came in, and so Peter was learning to accept everyone and now we see, though, that when people came down from the headquarters, you know, the Jewish people, to see if things are being done right, Peter said, oh, well, okay, let me, uh, yeah, I won't associate with those Gentile people anymore. We are Jews by birth, Paul says. Continue on here. Same passage, chapter 2. We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. So Paul says, I recognize there are two traditions here. He says, the Gentiles have just totally violate everything God said. And then we have over here the Jewish people that think they're going to be saved by doing everything God says. He says, we have these two groups, yet we know that no one is justified by the works of the law. So there are several things that Paul is talking about here. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about those writings of Moses other than the Ten Commandments and the traditions that were included in those. But he also is talking about the issue of salvation in all of this. And Paul makes it very clear, whether it's the Ten Commandments, whether it's the Mosaic Code, Salvation can never be achieved by the observance of law. It can only come through Jesus. No one is justified by the works of the law, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by the faithfulness of Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified, whether it's the Ten Commandments, whether it's any of the other code, circumcision, or whatever. Salvation will never come that way. So that was a principle now of which the Jewish people and the Gentiles had to get their mind around, that salvation will only be achieved because Jesus has been faithful to us and has made the way of salvation possible for us through what he did for us. Now, going back to the book of Acts, this is a passage that you're familiar with. This is the Council on Jerusalem. We've referenced this before, but let's visit it once again because it helps us better understand the historical context against which Paul was doing all these things. Paul had been out. He had been raising up churches. He had been over to the church in Antioch. And there in Antioch, over on the coast, several hundred miles away from Jerusalem, Paul had, had been there and there were believe, gotten the church going, and there were believers that came down from Jerusalem, once again came down from headquarters to see if things were being done right. Here's the story. Now some of the men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised, 
according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be what? You cannot be saved. So, you can see the tension that must have existed. Can you imagine being an 80-year-old Gentile that became a believer in Christ, and now they say, you're going to have to have a church ceremony here and get yourself circumcised. Well, they obviously created a lot of controversy. And Paul said, okay, look, whatever Moses has said is irrelevant to us today. Keep in mind that the thing of circumcision, that was sort of the premier part of the Mosaic Code. And Paul says, look, it's not necessary to be circumcised. And then you saw the end of the book in Galatians in chapter 5. He says, if you decide you want to be circumcised, I'm telling you, if you're doing that for religious reasons, you have left Jesus. He's no longer your Savior. Not because you can't be saved if you're circumcised. But he's talking about for religious purposes. We understand that. So this is what they were teaching. When Paul and Barnabas had a major argument and debate with them. So you can see, can you imagine being in that Antioch church? And you've got, you've got these people that were Gentiles that came into the church, and these guys come down from the headquarters to inspect that everything's being done right, and now they start telling everyone that you've got to be circumcised. And so Peter, I mean, Paul and Barnabas stood up and said, you do not have to keep the law of Moses. It is no longer relevant to Christians today. You don't have to do that. And so there was this big argument, this big debate over whether or not the law of Moses was relevant to Christians today. So Paul and Barnabas had this argument and debate with them. And the church appointed Paul and Barnabas and some others from among them to go up and meet with the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. So Paul now is going to go up to headquarters. But some from the religious party of the Pharisees who had believed stood up and said, this is when they got up there to the council, it is necessary to circumcise the Gentiles and to order them to observe the law of Moses. Two sides. The law of Moses is relevant to Christians. The law of Moses is irrelevant to Christians. Which is it? And so they now had this great powwow to try to figure it out. And so the Pharisees said, it is relevant to follow Moses and what Moses wrote in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. It's necessary to do that. Paul on the other hand said, it is not necessary to do that any longer. Both the apostles and the elders met together to deliberate about this matter. After there had been uh, a, a little bit of discussion, <laughs> been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God chose me to preach to the Gentiles so they would hear the message of the gospel, the good news, that is, you have been set free, the good news, and believe. So now why are you putting God to the test? You see what Peter's saying? He's saying God has released us from those things. And that was a yoke. That was a burden. Those writings and that legal code in the book of Moses. God has set us free from that. He says, why are you now trying to do what God has said doesn't need to be done any longer. If God said forget it, then forget it. He says, so why are you tempting God? So now why are you putting a yoke of test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors or we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way as they are. 
So that whole Mosaic code and the mentality that came with them, that it had to be observed and correctly always observed in every detail in order to have salvation, was a tremendous burden and yoke. Going now uh, back to the book of Galatians chapter 5. This is that passage that uh, we've looked at a couple times now. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to what? To all the law. So Paul says, if you want to choose circumcision, and he said that that you want to do circumcision so that now you have this right relationship with God, he says, it's not just circumcision. You have to take every bit of what Moses said, and you have to live by that and also be justified by it. We've already pointed out that that Ten Commandment moral code of God is separate from all these other legal requirements given by Moses. We could spend a lot more time on that transition that was made in Christianity from the legal code And the reason that Jesus pulled us away from that legal code of Moses and why the Apostle Paul pulled us away from that legal code of Moses. But we obviously don't have time to do that today. That would take a lot more time to do that. It's just the reality that the Bible lays out very clearly. Paul makes this issue very clearly. The moral code encased in the Ten Commandments is still relevant today. But all of those other things, we're not saved by that, but we want to live by it. But all that other legal code of Moses. You see, I see some people, they like to go back to that legal code, and just like Paul saw people doing here, they pull out one or two things that they like, and they try to impose that on themselves and probably everyone else. But you see, Paul clearly addressed that issue with Christians. That that Mosaic code is no longer relevant to us today. So that's the stand now that the New Testament has taken. Now, there's one other issue relating to all of this. It's still kind of hanging out there. In fact, on the way out uh, last week, and and by the way, I know what time it is. Give me just a couple more minutes, okay? (laughs) Okay. Someone on the way out of church last week mentioned this to me, and I said, yeah, I'm coming to that next week. And that is this thing of clean and unclean foods. And you can see where this gets a little touchy with Adventist, given what we've just looked at of what Paul said. Are are you kind of on the same track with me here? Because that clean and unclean food comes out of that Mosaic Code, right? Are you following me? That comes out of that Mosaic Code. And by the way, it's not the only clean and unclean thing in the Mosaic Code. There's some really, I mean, there's all kinds of strange things in there. I mean, you know, uh, 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 sexual activity makes you unclean. By the Mosaic Code, you can't go to church. You see how uncomfortable that would be if somebody doesn't come to church and say, hi, why were you missing last week? (laughs) So, I mean, there are a lot of unclean things back there in that moral code that Moses gave. And Paul says, if you pick one, you got to pick all of them. So you can see where this becomes a little uncomfortable for us as Adventists. Correct? 
because we have tended over the years to follow the Leviticus 11, clean and unclean, as it relates to, to food. Well, someone pointed this out one to me, and like I said, I mentioned that I was going to cover today. You may eat any moving thing that lives. This is God saying to Noah when Noah came out of the ark. He says, you may eat any moving thing that lives. As I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything, but you must not eat meat with the life in it that is with the blood in it. And so uh, someone pointed out to me, you know, it says everything. And it does say everything. But you know, when we say everything, we don't always mean everything, right? <laughs> we mean everything within the perspective of we know what we're talking about, correct? I mean, if you say to someone, ah, from a legal standpoint, you know, scriptural, legal, we're talking that way. You can eat anything that you want. And as I mentioned three or four weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, probably not many of you are going to take that as a license to go out and eat poison ivy. Right? So it's not really everything, but it's everything within the context of what we perceive and understand the background of a statement like that is. The problem that we have here is we don't have all the information. It's sort of just one little statement. But I understand the issue. And I can understand how someone would take that and say, yeah, God said, okay, you can eat all the plants. As I just mentioned, that probably didn't include poison ivy. But in any case, when we come to the animals, anything that moves on the earth, you can eat. It does seem that God was saying, all the animals out there you can eat. Here is where I think maybe we can uh, contemplate about this issue just a little bit. When Noah went into the ark, the animals did not all go in in equal numbers, did they? Some went in by sevens, and some went in by twos. Now, those animals that went in by twos, unless they had offspring on the boat during that time while they were in the ark, if you ate one of those when you came out of the ark, would they exist today? You see, I know that at least initially, that Noah did not eat snakes or pigs because we wouldn't have them today, right? So I, I understand that. But I also can understand how someone would say, well, this includes everything. When we come to the legal code of Moses, I have always said, we have to be careful about going back there and picking and choosing because that gets us in a lot of trouble with what Paul makes very clear. Are you with me? Kind of. <laughs> Paul said if you choose one, you have to do what? Choose all of them. You know, that includes, by the way, a woman that makes, a, a husband that makes accusations against his wife for infidelity. She has to go up to the church and eat dirt off the floor. You choose one, you have to choose all of them. However, on this particular issue, I think that we've made the right decision because I do think that because God made that distinguishment at the time of the flood, I think there's maybe some importance that we can read into that. However, let's be very careful not to put stumbling blocks in front of anyone that would keep them away from Jesus. Are you with me? Look, if a person doesn't have the same understanding that we have, of this issue of clean and unclean foods.
Who gives us the right to put a stumbling block in front of them to keep them away from Jesus? I think Paul has, at least in my mind, made the issue clear here. We will not always sort these issues out precisely. But just as a recap, Paul sets the Ten Commandments aside as different from the rest of that legal code of Moses. He says the moral code defined in the Ten Commandments defines sin for us. This other legal code of Moses is no longer relevant to us as Christians. I mean, that doesn't mean we can't learn some things from it. We can. But it no longer has legal implications for us as Christians today. And then, of course, the greatest and most important part is whatever the law is, the old legal code of Moses or the Ten Commandments, we are never saved by the observance of of those things but we are saved only by the grace of Jesus and by his grace we will never put a stumbling block in front of anyone to keep them away from Jesus would you stand with me